Welcome everyone to our presentation, Community Archiving Workshop and Audiovisual Collections Care in Tribal Archives. Um, I would want to welcome you. Uh, we do have a little QR code for everyone at home in their office here in the conference room uh, to the slides and notes that we already have that might help you um, go along with the presentation. Uh, who all here is familiar with Community Archiving Workshop out of um, for AV Kickstart Preservation? Show of hands. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, for those that are not familiar with it, um, it will be a fun um, informational thing about the work that we do. Uh, quick overview for this session. Um, I'll go over the background of Community Archiving Workshop, or CAW, and the Southwest cohort that we had um, last year. Uh, then Becky Wright from Ryan Dot Nation Cultural Center and Museum History in Oklahoma uh, will speak. And then Jonah from Indian Pueblo Cultural Center Library and Archives here in town will speak. And then Mindy and Macario will speak from Poet Cultural Central Archives Pueblo. I'm so sorry. And in Zuni archives, we have a representation from them as well, the Zuni tribal archives. Uh, so a little background on CA. Um, it began as a, a volunteer organized one day workshop at the EMEA conference back in 2011. And it's a one day workshop that pairs audiovisual archivists and local volunteers to inventory a collection for the day, which really kickstarts AV preservation, gets them on the ground floor of intellectual control of their collection and what they have. Uh, we first started out um, exclusively video. Our founder, Mona Jimenez, is a video specialist, a video preservation specialist, and she started the workshop back in 2010 in Philadelphia, at the Scribe Video Collection. And now as the collections, um, as the workshops we've done over the years, we added film in Austin in 2011, and then we added audio and then digital. So most of the workshops that we do kind of handles each kind of little format throughout the day. And at one workshop, we were able to do some live digitization. The group is, um, the core call group is of organizers from all over the country, uh, Canada, and in different stages of their um, there are different kinds of archivists, some at large institutions, and some are independent consultants. So we're going through, we have many projects um, that we're doing. The main ones that I want to point out, we have the handbook that teaches you how to organize a call in your community. We have the training of trainer workshops and curriculum that teaches you how to teach people to organize a, uh, a workshop in their community. And then we have the assessing and addressing digital readiness of audiovisual collections, um, a project that we're doing with um, Wills in Wisconsin, recollection. Um, so they um, did a great toolkit if um, any of y'all are familiar with it. Um, uh, Will's Recollection uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsin Historical Society, they, um, they created a toolkit about digital readiness and community of practice. And we um, provided, uh, we had an NHPRC grant that helped us work with them to add how to manage AV collections in your digital readiness assessment. And um, we're piloting a survey, so you might hear that through some of the presentations today about um, 
being a part of the pilot of working with the documentation and filling out the collection assessment survey. So the Southwest cohort is actually a merging of two grants and um, pandemic problem solving. We pivoted from ha a hands-on workshop, one day inventory materials to a remote <laughs> hands-on workshop, air quotes. Um, so we had a supplemental grant through IMLS to focus on the Southwest and provide workshops in the region here. And we also had our, our NA, NEH grant that was for tribal care of audiovisual collections, where we would go on site and work with collections at tribally held uh, cultural centers. And we combined these two groups, 10 um, repositories all together to a super Southwest cohort. And we, it was a nine month commitment. And, uh, sorry. And also for the NEH grant, we're spending this year finishing that up. We had a workshop in Temecula back in the fall. We just got back from Hawaii and well, we're having two workshops in Alaska. Um, in May, and then we'll be in Oklahoma for the next ATOM annual meeting there, Oklahoma City. So in part partnership with ATOM, the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums, we identified 10 um, partner organizations for our Southwest cohort. And we also had um, University of El Paso Libraries, if you're in the house, Claudia, they agreed to be the hub for um, housing the kits that we created for this project as well. So things that the collection, uh, the rep repositories had in common um, were they had unprocessed AV collections, um, they didn't know exactly what they had, but they knew they had something valuable. Um, they documented um, endangered uh, trend, uh, traditions such as storytelling, songs, and dance. Uh, they were confident that uh, more recordings would be discovered in the inventory process. And they also saw opportunity to grow um, by knowing what's in their collection, they could provide access to it and also um, have outreach into the community to grow their collections. So the goals of the cohort, we had, it was a nine month commitment and the primary goal was to inventory a sample size of about 200 AV assets. Um, we delivered nine webinars that are still available on our website and internet archive. Uh, we matched each, part, each partner with a call mentor to work one-on-one -on -one with their inventory. We developed preservation plans for each partner to guide further AV preservation for the remaining collections. We assisted in prioritizing items for digitization. And finally, we created two digitization kits and a film inspection kit with um, training webinars and written documentation. And they're all available on our call website. And one proud thing that came out of this um, remote hands-on workshop was the training kit. And I have pieced the training kit around the um, front of the thing um, so you can pass it around the room. We have the toolkit right there. We have the bag right there. You know, handle it, pass it on. And we also have, hi, Claudia. <laughs> no problem. And then we have the film examples that we laminated, not preservation quality, um, but it gave you good examples of the different film gauges. So please pass that around. Um, there's also a QR code that you can find um, more information about our training kit. 
And right after this presentation, I'm going off to the post office to mail that to Alaska. So <laughs> um, just a few screenshots from our re webinars, uh, remote training. This is from our first webinar, um, AV Basics, where we went through how identifying different parts of film, like film base. You can see we're holding up film to the light to show the difference between acetate and polyester film base. Um, and everybody in the film kit had um, different formats, video, film, um, that were provided um, from EMEA members that just sent us like all the kinds of video formats. And we even had a real nitrate that we did not laminate and send out. Um, we just tell you it says nitrate. Um, Here's from our second webinar, um, AV identification and assessment of magnetic material. And here we're going through all the different metadata, metadata, metadata items that you can find just on a simple video label, video cassette label. And we also had our inventory webinar where, yes, we had about 12 people in one Google Doc inventorying their sample items that were in their training kit um, and just going through step by step with what the fields are. Ka has a um, kind of a standard master inventory that we can build upon um, depending on what collect um, the repositories and what information they need to collect for their uh, collections. And finally, this is a one-on-one -on -one, um, mentor session where we're going through the inventory. You can see they're using the laminated film gauge to identify 16 millimeter film reel here. And um, that's all that I have. And now um, I have a recording from Becky Wright at Wyandotte Nation. She'll tell us about her experience. Kwe Amaru, Becky Wright, Ijatsi, Wandat, Ajutute, Inyomari Huti, Iwishas Ndi. Hello, my name is Becky Wright. I am the cultural researcher for Wyandotte Nation, and I'm going to talk to you about my experience with Ka and how much fun I had. Um, I work for the Wyandotte Nation Cultural Center and Museum. We're located in Wyandotte, Oklahoma, Northeast Oklahoma. Our nation is one of several Iroquoian tribes that were dispersed from our original Canadian homelands and are now in Northeast Oklahoma after a series of removals. And we opened our cultural center in 2016. We're so excited. Um, we were able to put our economic development to work for us as a people. And a couple of years ago, our cultural department became its own division, um, which is moving up in the world. And as a result, I was hired as the cultural researcher. I'm the first in my position. And one of my jobs is to organize and maintain our research library and archive. And part of that includes all our recordings. Well, let me tell you about our collection. Our collection is virtually unexplored at the time of my hiring. Um, there were boxes of things everywhere. We had absolutely no clue of what was recorded, what wasn't. We had no idea of what formats we had. And in fact, we had no idea if we even knew where everything was. So I was kind of freaked out about the whole taking care of the audiovisual part. And I had no idea where to begin. Uh, what do we have? What condition are things in? Um, we have just cardboard boxes. That is not good enough, I knew. Um, so when this opportunity uh, became available, I jumped at it. And once I started the process, 
things mysteriously began to appear on my desk. But the one thing that hasn't appeared, even to this day, is the playback equipment. So, Ka came to my rescue, and the fact that it was able to be virtual, um, new format because of the pandemic, actually really helped me a lot because part of my job, I work remotely, and part of my job, I work on site here in Oklahoma. My background is more library and education um, and more print than audiovisual. So I knew this was an area I needed to learn a lot about and learn from other people. So part of being the cohort that I really enjoyed was the fact that um, I was with a group of people who were all learning, learning where to start, and we were in different places and had different um, techniques. Being able to be paired with a mentor and working one-on-one -on -one with someone who got to know my collection as I got to know it, um, and someone I could talk things through with, that was invaluable, just having that experience. Our background uh, webinars that we had that gave us information that we needed, talk through different uh, techniques, different media, different needs, um, really filled that gap a lot because it wasn't just me watching some video on YouTube. Um, we actually had the opportunity to interact with whoever was presenting, and that made a really big impact on what information I was able to retain because I was able to ask things that pertain to what I was finding and what was showing up on my desk. And also having an inventory template that was provided to us um, took a lot of pressure off. In fact, my, my biggest thing, and I remember this conversation clearly with my mentor, was my stress over how on earth do I number things? And it was nice knowing that I needed to number things and I didn't have to think through that and I could concentrate on the little details. So definitely, definitely enjoyed the experience. So where are we now? Um, thanks to Ka, we know what we have, we have better storage, and we have a start for a plan for preservation. Um, and also stuff keeps showing up. These uh, lovely uh, discs and things showed up on my desk just last week, actually. So the next steps are going to be Piloting the audiovisual digital readiness survey, um, which was something that was suggested to me based on this whole process and what we have, and the fact that we are developing more born digital um, items, and we have things that are in such a condition that digitizing is going to be a really good option for us and not having a lot of experience with knowing whether or not we're digitally ready that um, pilot project really appealed um, also been uh, lucky enough to locate a vcr so we can start examining all these vaguely labeled tapes as you can see from the picture you can barely see anything if a spine label on some of our uh, VHS tapes. There's a lot of pressure to protect the original content we do have, um, but now I have a plan for moving forward with that. And I also am continuing to look for stuff here at The Nation. And that picture in the lower left with the cute little emoji, this was me a couple weeks ago looking for something in one of our archive files, only to find out that there was a record sitting in there that I had absolutely no idea about. So thank you for letting me talk about my experience with Ka and how much fun it has been getting to know my audiovisual collection and learning what I need to do to preserve it moving forward. 
and other next steps that are going to be really helpful. Tijame. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for attending our panel. My name is Jonna Payton. I uh, am an, an enrolled member of the Pueblo of Acoma, and through my great grandfather, I am also Laguna Pueblo. Um, welcome to the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, Library and Archives. I am the librarian and archivist there. Uh, I have two part-time staff and three dedicated volunteers. The center is owned and operated by the 19 Pueblos in New Mexico. So I'll give a general overview of our um, library and collections. So the IPCC library is a non-lending special collections library focused on the lives, histories, traditions, culture, and contemporary lives of the Pueblo people. We also have materials on native nations of the Southwest, tribal nations across the United States, as well as Aboriginal Australia and the Maori. Our 8,000 volume book collection consists primarily of donations, which is great for capturing out of publication older materials. The collection also includes older materials that show author bias and inaccurate representations. We have uh, dissertations and theses researched and authored by Pueblo students and or of American Indian topics. The books in our children and juvenile collection are primarily authored by indigenous people. We wanna make sure that youth see current representations of themselves in the pages and in the stories. We hold a range of art and Southwest magazines and journals. The vertical files shown here consist of newspaper articles from the 1970s to the mid 2000s. Each Pueblo has folders on topics like history, economic development and land. There are also biographical, but not genealogical files on Pueblos, such as Southwest artists, jewelers, painters, and authors. Lastly, a range of American Indian topics from agriculture, education, and food, to various tribal schools and colleges, plants, sports, and so on. The archives holds a range of items um, listed here, including special access and restricted books, which includes culturally sensitive materials as well as older fragile items, such as volumes from the Bureau of American Ethnography. We have a range of maps, including architectural drawings of campus buildings and a small collection of items centered on the Albuquerque Indian School, which is where the center sits on. We have several manuscript collections, notably that of Dr. Joe Sando from Walatoa, formerly known as Jemez Pueblo. He was an author, researcher, teacher, and helped start the library and archive. I processed a majority of the archival records of the Friends of the IPCC. The Friends supported the center through funding, education, docents, and volunteers. Most recently, we signed an agreement with the Northern Pueblos Tributaries Water Rights Association to archivally process the records we've housed for decades. And of course, we have unprocessed collections, which is a range of paper records that were collected at various, um, of various entities over the years, some of which no longer exist. So of course, you know the issues associated with records like that. Some of our collections are available online. Through a partnership with the University of New Mexico, ephemera and newsletters about the center were scanned and uploaded to the New Mexico Digital Collections website. There are some LibGuides on the University Library's Research Guides webpage. One initiative I, I started in response to COVID in late 2020 was the blog, Indigenous Connections and Collections. Aside from informing, my intent is to let people know that we, indigenous, indigenous nations the world over, are still here. 
In each post, I indicate what Native Nation people are from and include links. So our audio video collection consists of VHS and Betamax um, videotapes, audio cassettes, and CDs. These are considered high priority for the contents on them. The VHS tapes are of activities held at the center, including dances and lectures from the late 1980s and early 1990s. The audio cassettes are of lectures by Pueblo scholars and about American Indian topics recorded in the years 1977 to 2006. These were converted to CD. Uh, my MLIS from San Jose State is in archives and records management, but I had no experience with audiovisual materials. I appreciated the webinars on the basics of identifying and assessing analog media, metadata, planning, and disaster preparedness that CA offered. This project also required me, and I state required me, to do an inventory. So that had to be done. I also appreciated the ready-made inventory template and having mentors as guides. Um, so this is the starting point. Uh, we have 25 videos of symposiums, speakers, artists, interviews, and events held at the center. On the right is a, a viewing of three of the VHS videos that were digitized. An interview with Santo Domingo Pueblo jeweler, Seferino Tenorio. And in, in April 1989, North American Indian Women's Association Women's Event, a oh, Women's Day event with speakers, dancers, and a woman of the year was awarded. The bottom one is um, a symposium at the Pueblo Cultural Center of Potters that was held in April of 1996. There are more video and audio tapes to digitize and make available as research and perhaps teaching materials, as well as give a record of historical events at the center. So I've heard a lot of wonderful work being done by many of the academic libraries institutions here. Um, there is much work to be done to collect. There is much work that is being done to collect underrepresented and missing voices but I would respectfully like to remind you all to seek out partnerships with small community and tribal archives and archivists to help with any type of, of, of work like grant funding, writing letters of support, offering classes, any way to help support um, archivists, tribal archivists and community ar archivists. So I've been fortunate to have um, the Cultural Center has had volunteers since its inception. We have one present here today, Joe um, Sabatini. So I've been lucky that a lot of the videos have been labeled. So I know what's on these um, tapes and they have been intensively labeled. So that helps me. So in, in being able to pick, we had to pick um, a certain amount of videos to be digitized. And I was able to do 25. And so I was able to choose from those 25 videos and know what I was choosing without having the equipment to, um, there to, to view videos. So um, yes, I think that's it. So our next step is of course to continue with this, but as I said, I don't have much staff. So this will come in time as we get there, uh, but it definitely gives us a foundation for being able to move forward with any future audiovisual projects that we have. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I know it's been a very long day. Uh, my name is Makadi Gutierrez, and I'm a member of the Pueblo of Pawaki. I'm also here with my colleague and my sister, Mindy Little Yellowbird. We're one of six Tewa tribes in Northern New Mexico. And um, our traditional name is Suagia Wingia, which means the water drinking place. But we're uh, situated, we have two rivers that flow through our lands. And historically, back to ancient times, this is where people would, on their travels, would stop to gather the water, they'd have a meal, they'd talk, and then they'd go in their different directions. So it's a very special place for us. I, I'm talking from a small museum tribal perspective with very little funding. Um, 
very little staff, very little professionally uh, trained staff. So if there's anybody out there that's very starting out their archives, this is such a great program. I'm also the development director for the Po Cultural Center and our language, O, oh, means the pathway. So as you see, as I'm describing where I'm from and who I am, a lot of the things have meaning. And, you know, we're very unique at the Po Center in the fact that most of our employees are tribal members from the Pueblo of Powaki. If not, they're from the surrounding tribes or Native American. So it's a very different perspective that we bring and our collection reflects that. It's very unique. So a little bit about our collection, as you can see on the left-hand picture, very disorganized, not the proper housing. There was never an inventory that had been done. <clears throat> it was all unprocessed. It was basically a, a room full of boxes when I started four years ago. Poor little Mindy was sitting in the corner behind all these boxes. But you know, it was through these types of programs that we've been able to get organized and it's so much appreciated. Um, you know, because my background's in law enforcement and coming in to this field, you know, talking from a tribal perspective, once again, you know, a lot of these jobs, you know, they're filled by tribal members. And a lot of times, you know, there's no um, professional development. And so we're kind of just put in these positions. And so there's a lack of training. And so it's very intimidating to start. Where do I even begin? And even learning the terminology is just intimidating. As you can see a picture on the right, we did keep some of our playback equipment, which is going to be so valuable in the future. A little bit about our collection, you know, um, Pueblo history is not written, it's an oral history. So the language, the dances, the tradition, I learned from my parents, their parents, and it goes on since the beginning of time. It's never really written. And so for us, you know, we have tapes here they go back to the 60s and 70s, some of the 50s of council meeting minutes. These are very private meetings of the council. We have dance, dances, traditional dances. We have, um, we're not just a museum or a cultural facility, so we teach traditional arts. So we have videos of the art programs, how to make pottery, how to make jewelry, how to weave, how to make moccasins. And so this collection is so important, not just now, but hopefully in 50, 100 years, our kids will be watching this. Oh, this is how they dressed. Oh, this is where they put this. Oh, the feather went here. That direction was there. Oh, they said it this way, not that way. It's important for Pueblo history to carry on the way it was. Because once again, it was not written. So that's a, bit, a little bit about our collection. Um, our experience with call, like I said, I'm here with my sister, Mindy. And she'll talk a little bit about her experience and her perspective. Keep My name is Minty Little Yellowbird, and uh, I'm a tribal member of the Pueblos of Hawkey and San Clara Pueblos. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a tribal member of the Pueblo of Hawkey, but I'm from Hawkey and San Clara Pueblos. I've worked with the Poe Cultural Center for 21 years. I've been an archive specialist for five. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how Ka has helped me and worked with me. Um, Ka worked with the disabled. Uh, Ka took time to accommodate the disabled. And the reason I'm talking about it because I'm disabled. I have a few disabilities that I will, I have a few disabilities I would like to speak about that Ka did help to make things better for me. I'm, um, I'm legally deaf, I hear with cochlear implants. I'm visually impaired and I have a walking disability. I walk with leg braces. So there was two times I worked with Ka, one on Zoom and one in person uh, at ATOM. On Zoom, they actually made it, like copies and blew up the, the lettering for me so I could see because I can't see little words and they would um, send me the links a few days or a day before that so I could learn it so when they were teaching us what they were going to teach us I knew what I was what they were going to teach us ahead of time in case I didn't hear what they were saying so 
I would know what they were talking about and I already know what, like I would be lost. And when we went to ATOM, they made big, they made me um, paper copies of what they were gonna teach me. And they made, made the letters big on those too. And in the class, they actually made room for my scooter, which is over there, um, to accommodate me to go around the class. They taught me one-on-one, -on -one, uh, person to person, because I'm a visual learner. They also um, took the time to sit with me and teach me how to do the data, to do the spreadsheets. And um, they made me feel very comfortable. They made me feel very um, comfortable that to know that I can be an archivist and I can do everything that an archivist can do, even though I have all these disabilities. So um, I'm hoping Ka will, and ATOM will continue to work with the disabled and also um, continue to work with the the people with other disabilities other than what I, so that's what I have to say today. Yeah, I know there's a number of uh, institutions represented here today, and I think it's very important that we kind of um, uh, take many to heart, you know, um, include, include, include. So it's made her possible to be at work every day and be part of the, the Poe family. So we appreciate you so much. So really, like I said before, it was it was a starting point with Ka. We had no idea where to begin. And so like Jonah said, we had to start a spreadsheet. And this was really the starting port, point what got us to where we're at today. You know, um, we've been able to, through this spreadsheet and through this program, apply for different grants. So keep that in mind too. Once you go through this program, you know, grantors are gonna look at this and say, Wow, they're a little bit organized. What's the next step? You know, what's the plan? And so it really helps out for, for grant writing. But as you can see in the photos, we've been able to get some um, appropriate housing. Uh, the far picture on the right is a kind of a illustration that shows the digital DVDs as well as the transcribed copies. So you can see we're a little bit more organized now after doing this spreadsheet. Uh, the next steps for the, the PO really is um, to start to digitize. We work with the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, who sent us a lot of interns. So we're starting to digitize. One thing I'll also mention too is with CAW, you know, finding the playback equipment is so difficult. You know, it's gonna be almost impossible pretty soon. And so with CAW, they do have this training kit, but also look on their website. It is amazing. It is amazing. They actually have a list of every single adapter you need to start your own digitization kit. So if you want to start ordering your own things to create this kit, it's absolutely valuable. Thank you so much. So the Poe archives, like I said before, you know, it's a different perspective. It's not a dead archive. It's a living archive. We use it constantly. We use it for exhibits, for marketing. Um, I'm working on a project currently, it's called Then and Now, and it's a second edition. The first edition was done back in 1991, and it's a, it's a history of the Pueblo Poacias in Spanish colonial times up until 1991. And so I'm working on the second portion, reflecting everything that we've been able to accomplish since then. And how awesome is it going to be to include some of this video some of this audio to hear my dad, my grandpa, my grandma's voices and use these, you know, it's so valuable to us. So, you know, I want to thank you for your time, but I do also want to emphasize too, please, there's such a need in Indian country. And so whenever there's any type of workshops or any kind of professional development courses, please, please reach out, you know, because there's such a need. And also with my lovely sister here, please, you know, when you're even when you're preparing your slides, you know, kind of think in the back of your mind, you know, how can I do this so they can see it too, so they can hear it too? You know, how can I arrange my space so they can feel included? So that's what we want you to take away from our presentation today. And we thank you very much for including us and safe travels to all of you. Thank you. Thanks. Next up, we have Curtis and Carvana from the Zuni Tribal Archives. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Curtis Kwam. 
I um, am the museum technician culture educator here at the museum, Oshawa Museum and Heritage Center. And if you're not aware, uh, the Oshawa Museum uh, is actually in our language. And this is, um, but our whole title is saying this Museum and Heritage Center belongs to our people. Um, we also um, work with our sister program, the Tribal Archives. Um, for many years, uh, we've been kind of separated um, as different programs and even us as a museum, we were a nonprofit 501c3 organization for when I first started 20 um, some years ago uh, and operated this way. Um, it was just recently, I believe in 2018, 2019, where conversations from the formal tribal administration uh, took the museum under the tribal wing. And since then, it's been a working progress to get to where we are. Um, as being creating our own division, uh, the cultural resources division. And I think this will definitely expand on into different things. Um, I'm the museum, te the museum technician culture educator, but I also wear another hat. Um, I'm also part of the Zuni cultural resource advisory team for the, for the Pueblo. Um, and I work with different com committees and a lot of different programs within our community to help um, education and language uh, awareness. Uh, so a lot of those efforts, and we've been finding these really interesting treasures about within the archives. Uh, before I go further, uh, I definitely want to give um, some time for my colleague as well. Uh, Carvana Westica is the other side of the museum, uh, a, definitely a very big asset to, to me and the museum and the community as well. Um, so Carvana, uh, she's just a, a few feet from me. Um, so if, if you could introduce yourself. Oh, um, so um, sorry, were you on mute, Carvana? <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that, guys. Sorry, everyone. I guess I was on mute. Um, but uh, my name is Carvana Westica. I am the other half of the museum here. Uh, I jump in here and there to help her this out. Uh, we're sharing the same bandwidth. So, um, we either get video or audio, so sorry about that. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, and also for the host, uh, uh, we didn't get uh, enough time to get our slides in for our presentation, and I apologize for that. Uh, but we do also have a uh, some a virtual tool to work with. Uh, we have a partnership with Google Arts and Culture, so we have our museum on that page. So if I could be made co-host real quick, I can run through the museum um, and where we're situated if we are made co-host. If that's not available, I can definitely go on um, for speaking for sure. And if Carvana, if there's anything you wanna um, provide or add to anything that's happening, um, throw a stick over here uh, and you can let me know uh, to stop talking. Um, but if you, let's see, um, let me give it a try here. Uh, but let me know if you can make me close. If not, I'll just continue. Uh, so we are the Oshawa Museum and Heritage oh, Center in Zuni. Curtis, Pueblo. real quick, I will stop of, sharing um, so you can share. And we screen. are one of the 19 tribes that are here. Um, and we've been a museum since the early 1990s. Um, not they didn't have a building at that time and had a small board. Uh, and we've been working on different things. And once things started to work and open, we actually started to, like other people have noticed, we started to receive different things. Um, and we get the whole range of different things. It's things that we enjoy, uh, things that we can read, uh, publications from a long time ago, and sometimes even things that we don't want and not asking for. Um, we get these boxes that say, I shouldn't have took this. I was in the Pueblo X amount of years ago. And I took this from a secret site, and this is something that I did not uh, mean to disrespect the tribe in any way. And we kind of look at ourselves and we get these packages and say, what do you want us to do with it? <laughs> uh, we're not um, trying to correct your wrong. Uh, and, and there's a lot of different things, a lot of conversations that can happen from that. Um, and let's see here. Okay, thanks for making me co-host. Um, Let's see here. Um, can you see my screen? No, not yet. 
I don't think so. I'm looking over let's see here. Um, one second. All right. I think this needs to be re. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here we go. Um, and if you can see my screen, uh, so this is the Ashua Museum Heritage Center. Uh, again, we're in Zuni uh, Pueblo. We just recently um, launched this partnership with uh, Google Arts and Culture. And right now we have all the, like, the frame, the skeleton of what we want on our page right now. So we're very happy to have this and we're really excited to, about this opportunity. This is our museum. Um, it definitely looks like uh, an abandoned place, <laughs> um, but this actually has a lot of historical roots to it. This building that we're in right now uh, was built around 1910, 1911, and was originally a trading post. And we don't have anything to trade today, <laughs> but we have a lot of uh, information, content, resources that could help our community and also others. One of the common requests that we get is from people that are studying for their thesis and their dissertation and other scholarly things. And one of the really cool things also is our own community members. We have people from our community, actually high school students that came in yesterday that, that they're developing their own website. They're developing different things. And um, I definitely said, even if you wanna get on top of ours, we can link together. Um, and have a really good partnership and get more information from our source community. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, there's been a lot of other people in the scholarly world that have actually taken our voice and talked for us. Instead of a they kind of conversation, we are saying we. So this was an important thing to understand and also to get a hand of our collections. As you can see from our building, 1910 and 1911, it's taken a lot, uh, plenty of time for us to really develop professionally in this understanding of what we need to do with preserving archives and a lot of our collections. And so this is a really important uh, point in, in our history as, as the museum um, that is really belonging to us. We're taking ownership of it. And we recognize that there's a lot of information about Zuni and other tribes out there, but it's time for us to talk for ourselves. So this is one of the really big movements about a lot of that. Um, and preserving different things has been really important. We have the different te templates from our loaned artifacts from the Smithsonian. And we definitely have gone by that for many years, but we also know how inadequate it is for smaller institutions that don't have the budget um, that the bigger organizations have, as been mentioned. Uh, and I can definitely support the statements that have been said that we need support, we need help at times. Uh, we're a staff of two, so we take um, a lot of different things and we try to run with it, but it gets to be a lot of weight on our shoulders. And one of the reasons why actually we couldn't provide our slides in time because we had so many things going on. Um, so we're giving a voice to our collections and then we're also seeing and realizing how important the metadata is within collections. So the accession of collections is very vital and important. And now it's coming from us. Uh, we've been part of collections uh, consultations before in bigger museums where they had a really interesting labeling system of different uh, items that are, came from Zuni. One that I can think of that comes from Denver, I won't name the institution, um, but it was labeled a net sinker. And we usually like to prioritize the things that we like to see um, from things that might be sensitive and on down the list. And we saw this interesting label of a net sinker. And one of the things that really made us wonder what this was is like, we don't have a large enough body of water in Zuni to qualify for net fishing or anything like that. So we wondered what this was. Um, so this question was there until we got to the museum. When we got to this museum, uh, that's one of the first questions, like what's the net sinker look like? So we got to the collections and it was an ax head and it was mislabeled and misidentified. So now we actually corrected a little bit of that. And now we have the power of that. And I can see how a lot of these different things help balance these spheres of knowledge that are out there. Uh, again, for many years, we've been talked for. Now we're talking our own and we can come to a common level. And as mentioned, um, for the professional capacity of us as museum professionals, uh, we're building that, we're understanding that, but we also do not want to live um, behind a lot of our community sensitivities within collections, within different things that are out there. So as I mentioned before, we're a oral-based community. So every 
transfer, transference of knowledge ideally becomes to a face-to-face -face conversation. And a lot of these conversations, unfortunately, with the lifestyles that we live today, aren't always there. So we want to provide a resource in how we can get things, instead of just looking at things as art, having a bigger and broader context of why these are important to us today. And, and looking at these as inspiring as educational. Uh, one of the things that Ka is definitely uh, pointing out to us that's very apparent is that, again, to build up that professional capacity, we have to start somewhere. And when this happened, uh, I can definitely feel this energy coming up around. And we actually had an intern recently, and she took off with a lot of just a little bit of coaching. She blossomed into a really good thing. So we have our library in order. Um, and we have exhibitions here that we take care of. Uh, we have um, some things of, from the Zuni Day School, which was a, a school back in uh, as early as the late 1800s, uh, 1950s is most, most of the documentation that we have. But once you put things out and have a source voice to that, one of the things that has a ripple effect to that is things start to come back. Um, the former principal of the Zuni Day School, Claire Gonzalez, her family actually just reached, reached out recently and said we have slides from some of the photos that they took and they want to return that back to Zuni. Um, so with that coming back, we definitely have uh, a handle with the templates that were created that were really helpful um, to help make us be a little bit more successful and also on top of our collections. So this has been really exciting and showing different things from a lot of our points of view and uh, it goes into our traveling exhibitions. Um, you can get fancy with the... Um, the archival database material that's out there, but there's so much, there's a lot of different things. The whole spectrum of um, data entry is out there. And we didn't realize, I didn't realize that you could just use um, Excel. And this was like really um, making it more equal for a lot of people because most of us have Excel and access to that. So this helped a lot of that. So our what you're seeing right over here is our special traveling exhibition, the Ashuri Map Art Exhibition. Uh, it's now a public grant, and we got to accession this, um, not partly from the Cobb, but we've already had this, and it makes it a little bit more of a continuity um, within a lot of our collections. We do have historical audio. Um, altogether, we have close to 386 hours of audio, uh, but this full collection is 440 hours. Um, this is all traditional oral stories and also history events, a lot of very vital information that's out there. And as been mentioned, uh, this is really cool to hear from my ancestry. Uh, one of the things that they spiraled into was actually a winter storytelling project. We're in our fifth year. We just completed our fifth year, and now we're making films. So this is part of we're actually taking control of a lot of we're the executive producer for this filming project. Um, all of it is geared towards the community people. And this is something that has really been helpful. And now we can look at the metadata, we can see the accessioning, and we can really take control of a lot of this and get more awareness out there. So if anything, it's really helped um, scratch the surface in a really good way to start sowing the seeds of the future and make this really happen in, a, in the best possible way. It goes into our historic photos. We definitely know that there's a lot of other challenges of uh, copywriting material that are is out there uh, that was not made by us, but about us. Uh, so one of the things that the historic photos definitely show is that a lot of them slowly over time are becoming open sourced. And we've definitely tried to work with partnership with the Smithsonian and others to get more a handle of a lot of our own collections, our intellectual property. Um, so definitely this is an interesting thing. We have also films of Zuni from 1923. We're finding more. We're actually getting one digitized uh, from the Smithsonian. And like mentioned with the others, we just did not have the capacity uh, uh, and the machinery and the, and the tools and the toys uh, to make this happen. So it, I really appreciate Ka and everybody that's there that actually helped us along uh, because this provides a boost up for us. Um, I can only speak for myself, but I don't have a museum background um, in college. I went for medical lab um, in college, and I'm not bragging about that because I did horrible in school. <laughs> uh, but when I found my place at the museum, I really started to learn and understand how important this is. And 
being an oral-based community and culture, uh, we're starting to see the value of documentation from our own voice. We know that the Frank Hamilton Cushing, Matilda Cox Stevenson's recorded our history, but they did not write, record the right voice. And that made some things a little more traumatic for us now to deal with. And this complex oh, ball of issues that we can definitely start to rectify, at least understand and pass it on to the next generation is gonna be important. Um, so we have a library that we're, we've all have, we have this accessioned and all, everything that's printed about Zuni, hopefully we have, um, but this creates a greater conversation about what else is out there. What may we not know about that's out there that we could have here. Um, so we've definitely started to work on a lot of different things. There was a historical, not historical, but now it is. Um, it's getting to be a 1990s publication of newspapers. And this one over here features our Smithsonian loan object in 2000, 2001, and 2002 uh, from artifacts coming back. Um, so this is something that has been really interesting for us. And we definitely appreciate all the, the time and attention that Carl has given us um, Carvana, I'm not sure if you want to add to anything um, from here. If not, we can wrap it up um, after, but Carvana? Okay, she didn't throw a pencil at me, so I'm assuming that that's uh, the sign for everything's okay. <laughs> and um, So again, I appreciate the uh, the time, and I, I heard it's a long day. I can, I can relate to that. I have a tribal council meeting right after this one. <laughs> um, so I appreciate the time, and again, thanks for all the help. And that's been our experience, and I'm pretty sure I'm leaving a few details out. But it's been an enjoyable one and also a very um, fruitful one as well. Even though these seeds may be sold later on in the future years, we're excited for the future. Thank you. El Aqua. Thank you, Curtis and Carvana. Okay. So here's our contact information, jot it down really fast. Um, again, they're on the slides on the PDF that we link to. Um, I believe um, you can contact Ka anytime. I'll get the email and I'll reply or send it off to one of the call members to reply on anything. And thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Great, thank you, uh, everyone who has a question. There's a question there. And people in chat, please put questions in chat. We'll get to those too, but I'll be the one running the microphone. No. My question is, for those organizations or archives or agencies are asking for their help, who do they contact? Because sometimes tribes don't have anybody to contact and then they don't know where to, you know, who, who do, how do they do that? Uh, well, you just reach out to any anyone. There's cultural centers, there's libraries, there's museums. Okay, so she's asking, well, if you don't have a place or someone to go to, who do you go to? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an answer. Yeah. And sometimes it seems bulky, right? Like we we have this stuff that we want to contact you about, or we want to do a project with you. As tribal, sometimes sometimes you're a little hesitant to answer those those kinds of those kinds of calls. So maybe like a toolkit. How do we reach out? <laughs> Right. Uh, so she mentioned uh, so like a toolkit for how to reach out. Well, the 
toolkits I know of are for those that have a cultural center of some sort. So, you know, other than that, anyone in the audience have a answer? Right. Fabulous, Ryan. Atom is what Ryan Flayhive said. Uh, and that is a great place to reach out to. And I'm going to run and get the mic to Diane. Oop. Sorry. Uh, one of the, anybody can call, call anybody in the museum. I'm Diane Bird. I'm from Santo Domingo Pueblo. I work as an archivist at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe. I've also been the first archivist at the National Museum of the American Indian. We had calls from up and down the hemisphere. I took calls from a, a person in Canada, and they wanted to make sure that we had the birch bark scrolls there. And the second instruction, since this is from the Native people, was not for us not to enroll them. And this was me in archives answering a question about birch bark scrolls. And I had to explain to the lady, she was Native Canadian, that she contacted a good person and that I would get her in contact with the collections person. And I guess she thought since they were kind of what we would call written, that they would be in the archive. But we were all cross-trained and, and we're hemispheric, right? National Museum of the American Indian was is hemispheric. So we get calls from Canada, we get calls from the United States, we get calls from South America through translators. So all of us on staff were trained to handle calls. So I made a call to the collections manager and the registrar. We all knew each other. We were small at that time. We we're at the Cultural Resources Center in Suitland, Maryland, not downtown DCA. That hadn't been built yet. So um, I found out that birch bark scrolls were in conservation and they were being humidified because they were ready to unroll them. So I had to run in there and say, look, I just got a call from Canada. They don't want us to unroll them. They don't want us to touch them. So it's there's communication. We talk to each other. If you were to call me at the museum, say about an artifact, I would put you in, in touch with a collections manager. So that's what I want to relay to everybody here is feel free to contact a museum if at first the first person you don't you talk to doesn't have the answer, ask them to refer you to someone else and we will help you. Anyone else want to respond to that? Any hands up on that? Any other questions that have percolated during this? There's a bunch of people in the chat that have asked questions. So I can, sorry. <laughs> I can do my best to also read the chats here. Is that the only question so far? Is that one that's right there? But the one here from Anna White. Yeah, I heard a couple presenters use the phrase living archive. I think it's a wonderful description. Has this experience in any way influenced the way that you will attempt to preserve information or materials as they are being created or accessioned. It's like you were ready. Well, I think for me, because it's not, it's not just a job for me. I don't go in and just file things. I mean, I have a connection to almost everything that I'm touching because it's either produced by the Pueblo Poake or I'm related to someone from there. So it's a, not just a job. It's an intimate feeling for me. I feel honored every day to be able to go in and I'm the caretaker for these voices, you know, for these documents and what a powerful thing. And so it is a living archive. And like I said, we use it for exhibits and we do treat them a little bit differently now. And they're, like I said, they jump to the top of the priority list for us to digitize just because like I mentioned before, the formats are be non-existence pretty soon. So we do care for them a little bit differently now. That's just my perspective as a tribal person though. Anybody else? Well, I think it's at the foundation of everything we do. You know, that's it. It's not something we implement per se. It's just there. It's always at the foundation of our caring and stewardship of our objects and materials. Curtis, do you have a, um, any comments on Living Archive? Only that we're becoming one. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it's it's a definitely a definitely good way to describe a lot of our our, our understanding um, and continuance. One of the definite understandings that we have about our knowledge 
is that it's some of it is definitely verbatim. Uh, it's word for word. Uh, our ceremonies are done in the way that they always have to be done. Um, and then there's this juxtaposition of some of the scholarly world that we see um, that in a time where our communities were under maybe a little more duress than we are today, um, there was information that came out and the information that came out wasn't the correct one <laughs> that we see today. Um, I told a group of uh, students that came in yesterday um, when I first started, like I definitely thought the, in their shoes at their, their age, I thought the truth was in the books. Um, as I as I moved on in life and even today, I really started to think this as a, at a certain midpoint of it, I started to think they're all wrong <laughs> and getting frustrated with books. Um, and then coming to this point of clarity of it, it is a perspective and an added perspective to my understanding and that I needed this frustration, I needed this challenge to have a better understanding of who I am as a person from the community um, that I have a role within it. So I definitely, I think uh, this label of living archive is, is the, like the best possible way to um, see different things because the written form of it, the documentation of it is just one side. Um, and it's just like our selfies today so you have to look for the right angle um, sometimes. And sometimes you're like me, you don't find the right one at all. And always end up looking up angry or something like that. Um, so you just kind of go with the best side that you can. Um, so after this, do not look up my Facebook profile because you'll see the worst side of me. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but I think it's a good thing just to have a conversation with. Uh, and the conversations that these documents, these archives, and everything behind it um, is important to have and, and developing it um, to our standards and specifications that we need to keep things going. Thank you. Any questions that you want to ask the audience at all? Oh, go for it here. Hi there. Um, so with CAW, is this like a one-time cohort or a thing that you're doing? Um, the reason I ask is because, you know, it's great that you're providing training materials for tribes. Um, and our my archivist here and I were with um, Delaware Nation and Anadarko, Oklahoma, and we've been doing, um, you know, going through our archives and digitizing everything. But what we've run across is... Um, how do we develop policy for all of this? Um, so is there going to be, you know, maybe a phase two where you can assist tribes with developing policy for that? That's specific to tribes because it's going to be a, a lot different than what you find online. So, yeah, uh, we really found like a mission um, when working with ATOM. So we're building our relationship with ATOM and we want to do a second round of NEH grant that really focuses on the need, on collection needs, and not so much regional. And we have been doing a workshop at ATOM since 2018, and that will continue. So yeah, we're really passionate about this. We really want to get more into it and go around and work with collections where the collections live. That's a goal. Hi, I'm Claudia Rivers, and I was a participant in a call workshop, but it was during the pandemic and everything was online. So it's actually great to see some people in person. And I am, I just got an invitation to go to the ATOM training uh, next fall, and I'm looking forward to that. But uh, we were, I'm at UT El Paso, and we have the kit, kits uh, that they put together with some of the equipment that's hard to find uh, to, to allow people to digitize some of these older uh, media formats. And we just shipped them to Hawaii. And then I understand they're going from Hawaii to Alaska, and then they'll come back to El Paso. But anyway, there are these traveling kits just so that y'all know where they are or where they will be eventually. 
and a little bit about the kits um, in our ho- at our Hawaii workshop in Honolulu, we actually demonstrated the kits, which was a big hit. It was a hit with the kits. Um, so we're going to probably ask Claudia and our other partners that have kits to maybe ship them off to collections. We'll definitely have them at Atom and we'll show you how to use them and also how to set them up. We have videos that walks you through the process. The cables are labeled A. You stick it in A. You know, it's very easy to kind of walk through and set up these digitization kits. And we have the entire equipment list online. And um, I'm just looking at the chat again. It looks like Lauren has self-admitted a shameless plug for ATOM this year, where uh, Lauren will be presenting on Digital Preservation 101 in a pre-conference workshop. So it will include policy suggestions and templates. So thank you, um, Lauren. And Anna is asking, to the previous question about resources, does anyone have experience with this resource in terms of its reliability provided by the SAA, so the Society of American Archivists? And I can already tell based on the link that that is the Protocols for Native American Archival Materials. Um, Does anyone want to speak about the protocols? I could say a couple of things about them, but uh, does anyone have experience deploying them, using them in relationship to this discussion? They're uh, a really, really, really helpful standard that were sort of set the bar uh, for non-Indigenous institutions that house uh, Indigenous information. Um, And it's basically a uh, a kind of a set of agreements between the institution and the communities as to who's responsible for what in that collaboration, um, and that falls under several different kind of categories. So it really, um, it was a grassroots effort that came from the bottom up, and it was presented to the Society of American Archivists in 2006, and it uh, got a response that was a little tepid from um, archivists in the society, but It took about 10 years and a lot of institutions uh, grappling and kind of coming to terms with their holdings and deploying and endorsing the protocols and uh, exercising that that really saw the 2018 decision by SAA board to endorse them formally as a standard. So that was a big movement and lots of things have happened even since then. So um, that's a great standard and thank you for um, mentioning them. If anyone else has anything to say about that, I'm happy to pass the mic. Let's give it back to you. All right. Any more questions? Well, awesome. Thank you so much for coming to our presentation. I love talking about call and I love meeting our partners in person. (laughs) So any other final thoughts? All right. Thanks again. Bye.